And I also want to uh, bring um, Sonny's challenge, bring DNA to neuroscience. But I'll, what I'll do is I'll bring methylated DNA to neuroscience. But I think for all the students out there, I think he's 100% correct that we need to, to move in this area a bit. So actually, for those of you that, that are keen here, I put mammalian because instead of human, because um, work from Wei Tian uh, in the lab was just published this week in Science. So I'm gonna focus on two, um, two unpublished stories that are, that are in the mouse brain um, by these unbelievably talented students. And I, I won't go through their accolades, but this guy's headed as a, to Harvard as a junior scholar, this guy's headed to ARC as a first, their first fellow, Chicago, and I hope Wei will stay around a bit. Uh, amazing. Uh, so Way's paper, just to put it, this is the sort of summary summary aspect. Is uh, I, I encourage you to read it. It's got all sorts of interesting biology, including barcodes. And that's not Tom's sort of barcodes. This is a methylation barcodes that you can identify any neuron, and maybe this can even be used in circulating DNA, because we have thousands of cell types that we can identify with the methylated DNA, as you'll see. So one characteristic of, you know, the, of neurons is their, their morphology. And you saw a beautiful diagram by Don of the Ramoni Cajal's um, uh, depictions of different neurons, Purkinje neurons, et cetera. Electrophysiology is used, and that's basically how we characterize new neurons, their connectivity and their gene expression. But what I want to talk about today is use of some assays that we developed, multi-omic assays, particularly the, what, this one here called single nucleus methyl 3C seq. So we're measuring DNA methylation and chromatin conformation in the same assay and the others are listed here. So we've applied this SNM 3C and Bing mentioned this, Bing, Bing's lab in parallel, had, and he had a better name, methyl high C, we should probably call it methyl. It wasn't, we sort of looked at, it wasn't completely high C, so we called it 3C. So we've applied that approach to look at single nuclei, chromatin and DNA methylation uh, in a variety of systems that I won't, some of them are in preparation, but what I wanna talk about is the mouse study that's here. This is the, the human study that has just appeared in science. Why do this? Why, what's, why, why are we obsessed, if you will, with DNA methylation? So changes in DNA methylation and the, the levels of the protein that bind it have been implicated in all sorts of cognitive decline. You can find many, many papers that have done some assay and suggest that DNA methylation correlated. Uh, mice with, and this was already mentioned, uh, mice with various deletions of methyltransferases. Um, the one I'll talk about, it's responsible for the kind of methylation we're interested in, it's the NMT3A, uh, cause, uh, long-term neuroplasticity, cognitive defects, and we've actually made the mutation to DNMT3A at a particular time in the development of this form of methylation I'll talk about. And, and really, we don't know a whole lot uh, about when and where and what cell types methylation patterns are occurring in the brain because it was mentioned there's 80, you know, in human brain, 80 billion neurons, right? And so we want to try to understand the epigenetic profiles of a subset of those. And so this is what really got us interested in this one form of methylation. So there's actually two forms of, there's more than two forms of methylation, and Angina mentioned this. There's hydroxymethylated formal, uh, carboxyl, et cetera. But the, what I'll talk about today are either CG methylation, and actually the dominant form of methylation in your brain is CH. Mostly it's CA. Okay, and this sort of went under the radar for many decades. So this would be CG methylation if you're just measuring bulk in human uh, or in mouse uh, across developmental time. And the, 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 the CH methylation actually accumulates just before birth, you can detect it. We had a paper a few years ago looking at fetal development in collaboration with Bing um, to look at mouse fetal development. And what we observed is, is that there's a dramatic increase from almost nothing to um, maturation in adults about 25 years old. So, you know, the, the, empirically, the car companies figured this out, that, that, that you don't rent a car to someone until you're, they're 25 years old. The brain isn't, isn't actually completely epigenetically mature. And so uh, I think that that's probably true. Synaptogenesis is happening 
right during this same period of time. So interesting uh, correlation here. So actually, if you look at the abundance, and this is now just looking at cortex, uh, you know, the, there's more CA methylation in your neurons than, right? Most people haven't even heard of this. When I say, what's, you know, CH methylation, they say, I don't know what it is. Well, in your neurons, it's more abundant than canonical CG methylation. And just to give you an idea of what that looks like, and this is actually using sorted, this was a collaboration with Jeremy Nathan's lab from a few years ago, where we looked at, you know, um, RNA, uh, uh, we actually had some chromatin assays that I'm not showing you in here. But what, what we're looking at here is the methylation uh, depletion in inhibitory neuron populations, right here. PV and VIP, you know, you see this footprint and that footprint is correlated with the, with the expression of, of the gene. So you can see here RNA. If you were just to look at cortex, you'd say, oh, it's expressed in, you know, in cortex, uh, uh, which is basically a bulk assay, but it's actually really expressed in PV and VIP inhibitor, inhibitory neurons. And when you look here at the CH level, you can see that it's sort of a footprint of the transcription unit, right? So, Transcription unit is here for important gene involved in neurotransmitter transport. And you can see the footprint here. And here's just another example where you even have uh, PV specific expression, and here's the footprint there. So um, this is in blue is the CH methylation. Oh, and if you, right, and so we're still in this case looking at many um, neurons, right? Each one of these. Uh, profiles here has many different subtypes, as you'll see. And if you actually measure the real estate across the genome, this is how much the CH methylation uh, encompasses compared to the CG methylation. Right, so this is the sort of dominant form of methylation, and this isn't uh, uh, mammalian specific. This is a vertebrate innovation that goes all the way back to, um, uh, that you can see it in zebrafish, you see it sort of drops out here. We're looking at the CA methylation, and this isn't really above background, octopus, honeybee, et cetera. And these are the context, sort of the footprint that you see. Uh, and you can, you can find mouse and, and regions. You can find neurons in the subcortical areas of humans that have 10% of all Cs are methylated in, in CA context. And so we, uh, we in this case, is a collaboration with Margaret Behrens, who's a neuroscientist at the SALT, created a, a mouse knockout, and measured a bunch of phenotypes uh, from sorted uh, excitatory neurons that were collected that were using a, a, the same strategy that we used with Jeremy, where Jeremy made a mouse called an intact mouse, which you can uh, have a, a CRE that's activated that results in the incorporation of a nuclear membrane protein that you can purify. Um, new N uh, or GFP plus and also sort for new N. And so we can measure methylation or electrophysiology or behavior, and this just shows the, the loss of the, the DNMT. And, and Marga and colleagues measured, used a number of, of tests, uh, working maze, uh, Y maze, novelty seeking assay, acoustic startle, and there were significant differences, even some male female differences. But to me, it wasn't as striking if, because you eliminate, when you knock out DNMT3A, all of that CA methylation. I won't even show you that because there's nothing to show. Um, but here's what you see. So here's what you see. Uh, the interesting aspect is, is that when you knock out this, at right during this critical period, from P0 to P14, that's where this knockout occurs. If you do it before, the mouse die. If you do it after, you don't see much. So once the pattern is established, you don't see a whole lot of phenotype. Uh, and in parallel, Huda Zogby and we collaborated with Huda looked at some inhibitory neuron types in this assay. But what you can see here is, is that when you knock out, in the knockout at P39, and you're looking at CG methylation, you see the loss of what you would expect to be methylated region, and these are replicates. So there are thousands of regions like this. So when you drop out all CA methylation, you also impact thousands of loci in the CG context. And, and interestingly, so that's, that's one example of many thousands. The other thing is, is that um, maybe part of the reason you don't see a lot of phenotype is, is that for those exact regions that are uh, um, CG methylated that lose, uh, that are lost, you see a polycomb, uh, um, substrate here, H3K27, basically takes over and spreads in all of those regions. So if you get compensation, 
So the brain is somewhat complicated here in that, you know, you, you create a knockout, but that the maybe part of the phenotypes are suppressed by a, another repressive mark. And there's a relationship between C methylation and polycomb during development as well. And what, what, what's interesting is, is that when we first um, discovered this uh, uh, in, in accumulation, accumulation in human neurons during development, folks that work at IMECP2 said, you know, we're having trouble interpreting our data between different laboratories. But when they focused on the CA genes, the ones that accumulated a lot of CA across the gene body, all of the sort of data together kind of sort of came together. And, uh, and that's work from um, um, Huda Zaghi's lab and from um, uh, the Gable lab uh, and also from um, um, Adrian, Adrian Bird's lab. Adrian actually did a very interesting experiment. He swapped out the domain of a methyl binding protein for the MECP2 CG binding proteins. Okay, so this methyl binding protein can only bind CG, it couldn't bind CA. And he, and he then added the MECP2 domain that's, that, that it's required for function, but it didn't complement the knockout. So his paper is titled, The Essential Role for CA Methylation and Rett Syndrome. Okay, so there is a role for CA methylation in si presumably in recruiting uh, repressor complexes to silence those genes. So a lot of CA methylation on the body of the gene means that you are not expressed, okay? Uh, so um, recording the levels of methylation in these various types of neurons is, will help us, we believe, in our hypothesis, it's gonna help us to distinguish subtypes, but more importantly, identify gene regulatory elements. And Bing talked about this, that you can use a tax seek to, to also uh, identify. But I, I, there, I don't have time, but there's, there's a very large amount of methylation, just uh, um, differential methylation across the cell types, as you'll see, uh, that encompasses about half of the mouse genome when you take all the neurons and look at them, okay? So there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of information there that doesn't overlap with attack seek. Um, <laughs> What are the similarities and differences across the branch? How are these, are these stable um, changes in angina? And um, Nat Hines had a very nice paper describing, I think probably the first case where you have active DNA demethylation in the cerebellum. It was a V-Life paper from last year. And then can we identify alterations that in sort of developmental diseases that might alter this pattern of CA accumulation over genes? So, and the other thing, and also being mentioned this, is that um, the, the nucleotide variants that have been identified from a lot of these GWAS studies could then be placed into a context of a neuron subtype, right? Using hypomethylated regions that are enriched in these genetic variants, and being mentioned that for attack seek. So what we did was, um, we focused on the mouse brain in this project. We dissected 117 regions when you incorporate, this is just single methylation assay, and then we switch to the SNM3C, uh, and also this was a, a really very close collaboration with Bing Ren, where we actually split the pool of nuclei. So Bing's lab got a fraction of the exact same population nuclei. And all total was, a, I don't know, close to a trillion reads that were involved in this. We sequenced about two million reads per nuclei, and then we also applied this at same assay to look at projection neurons. And I'm not sure I'll have time to get to that, but I hope to be able to. So these are the brain regions that we studied. And this is sort of, um, uh, it's a little easier to study mouse than human because there's a common coordinate framework that the Allen Institute has put together. And so we're just using male C57 black six, eight weeks old, dissect regions that are uh, of the brain into 16 slices. Um, six, 600 microns each that cover most of the major brain regions. Um, and then we carry out uh, uh, unsupervised clustering, and we used about, in this case, about a half a million methylomes that where we get about 5 to 10 percent coverage of the genome. So these are not full coverage methylomes. Um, and what I'm showing here is the different um, areas of the brain mapped onto this UMAP. 
And one thing that was kind of interesting right from the beginning is these are the cortical areas here with some complexity and there's some gradients of methylation. You can actually see the layers here. But the subcortical areas, right, are way more complicated in terms of they sort of look like a splatter, if you will, of a you know, bug on your windshield. You see this, this splatter. And that's true of any modality that you look at, whether it's RNA or uh, open chromatin or accessible chromatin. So that's an interesting study. And this just shows a few genes, glutamate transporter and a, and a glutamate decarboxylation, where the blue here is the hypomethylated regions, and it would reflect the expression of that gene. So wherever you see blue here, you predict with very high accuracy the expression of the gene. And we know this because we've compared this data to another assay that we developed where you have methylation and RNA from the same nucleus. So when we know there's hypomethylation of the gene body in MCA uh, or MCH, that that gene is expressed. And we can measure up to almost all the genes. So by simply looking at the hypomethylation, we can get deeper information than you can with most RNA-seq assays. And then we can go back and validate that, and we have. Um, and then this just is a, a, a summary of the cell types the major cell groups from cortex, olfactory, et cetera, and then looking at the, in this case, this is the sort of two steps down in terms of the clustering, where we're, we have the different cell types that are indicated here and their neuro predicted neurotransmitter usage here down at the bottom. But you can go another level of sort of subclustering. Oh, oh, one thing I wanted to mention is I, I asked one of the uh, postdocs to say, okay, what happens if you just take repetitive DNA? Take a line element sequence where you've cut it out, take them all, go to repeat masker and cut them out, and then do the clustering. In fact, so b based on the methylation data, you can get a pretty good map of what, what a cell type is just by looking at the methylation differences in those cell types from the line elements. And not quite as good, but also the sign elements. Okay, so what is this telling you? That there's information in those, in those and this is, these are we removed any genes, the fragments that would be nearby, that would allow you to tell what type of, tell, cell type it is just from looking at the, that pattern. So once, you know, we want to put this, and this was mentioned earlier by, by Long, we want to get this sort of single cell clustering into a, into a spatial context. So we, we're able to take, um, we, we use a, a MRFish assay, MRScope, uh, commercial MRScope of this assay developed by uh, Xiaoyi Zhuang, to be able to integrate not only uh, um, methylation data, we can also integrate attack-seq data and RNA-seq data, but this is just for the methylation data. And we can impute that into the space because we know the hypomethylated regions are indicative of RNA expression, and this is an assay basically for, um, for RNA uh, expression. And so we can, we can impute that data, we can integrate that data, and it actually works really well. These are the dissected regions on the top, and we didn't add any labels uh, until after we integrated the data here. Uh, and you can see, you know, there's cells that don't map, you know, there's some green cells that should be up here, et cetera, but overall, you get a picture that looks pretty much like the dissection or exactly like the MERSCOPE when you're hybridizing. So what that allows you to do is not only move the RNA data, uh, or the methylation data into that context, you can also put the chromatin context information into that context, and you can look at diff differences in, in TAD structure across you know, for example, these different regions or these different layers of the cortex. So you see changes that are, you know, these are the same cell type, you know, Purkinje, uh, or, or in this case, excitatory neurons uh, in the uh, pyramidal neurons in the cortical layers, uh, and, and you can see changes in their TAD boundaries. So the other thing is you can look at um, the projection targets. Okay, using this assay. So we want to know what are the long distance projections? Can we use the methylation data for that? So how can, can we use single cell methylation assays to inform us about projections? You know, are neurons that are in the same brain region sitting right next to one another that project to different regions, are they the same epigenetically or are they different? Okay, can they be distinguished? You know, are there principles that we can learn from this that, that we didn't know about um, uh, and, you know, can we use this in future studies related to human biology? Okay, so this is an assay, and this is a, 
an assay where we, uh, we look at, um, we inject AAV retro into a target region, okay, so an, an area of the brain, and then we collect nuclei that have been activated in their GFP because this is a Cree, uh, the AAV retro Cree, and so if the virus moves retrograde into those source regions, we collect those uh, GFP nuclei, right? We dissect the uh, various regions of the mouse brain, and then we, we fact sort those, carry out by sulfite sequencing, and then um, prepare libraries and methylation. And these are all of the, the, um, the regions. So we have two regions. We have 24 target regions where we injected in the mouse, uh, and we have 32 source regions where we collected. So that's a combination of 225 uh, uh, um, projection mapping experiments, and I'll just show you one, okay? So hypothalamus, where we collected, so we injected into these 10 regions here. If you go down, you can see the regions we're injected, pons, medulla, et cetera. And then here's the hypothalamus. So we're collecting only hypo hypothalamic neurons, and th there's 94 clusters from the source. So this is, these are all hypothalamic neurons, and we're just labeling those same hypothalamic neurons down here based on where we injected we were injected. And so we see these are the 10 target regions. You can see they sort of form into different clusters. And so the injected regions, for, so we, then we can look at those cell, cell types and classify them based on uh, gene expression. So here they are again. There's uh, 17 different types of neurons that, that are there and are actually enriched depending upon where the target was. So here's uh, th thalamus, stri the, the striatum, um, pons, medulla. Okay, we can see some enrichments. Now, if we project that information into the space with Merscope, you can see that the ones that are labeled here, these three, actually have very unique patterns in the in the hypothalamus. They're not just they're not just randomly distributed. They're enriched in different regions, regions that you really couldn't dissect. You can see the same things here for these three groups, that they're isolated in specific regions. And it, here's a, a sagittal section where you can see an alignment of these different neuron types. So they're all hypothalamic neurons, but they, they're from, they project different regions of the brain. So why do this? The, the reason, one of the reasons to do this, and this is just another example, is, is that we can identify the differentially methylated regions that may be controlling, you know, the, the enhancer regions that, and the genes that are affected in these neurons. So you can have two neuron groups sitting together that have different epigenetic profiles and potentially build tools that will allow you, you know, an AAV that contains an enhancer from a region that's a projection-specific neuron and put that back in and express if you want to alter the physiology of those neurons only in a specific cell type, or if you want to in, think about it in humans, we have colleagues at UCSD carrying out delivery experiments of BDNF into Alzheimer's brain to try to target it to the endorheal cortex, and they have no promoters, right, to, or enhancers to do that. So this presumably can provide some tools called in the neuros field genetic drivers, which always confuses me a little bit. So just to end here, you know, using these, this assay, and I didn't talk about anything sort of up here, but we can call compartments, tad boundaries, and loops, obviously, in the 3C data, to be able to identify regulatory elements that are cell type specific that we can use for, you know, in future studies, in the human studies, to begin to look at various neurological diseases, but also to use as drivers for, for further experiments. And so I'll stop here and acknowledge the folks I mentioned the amazing folks uh, and the first slide that we're doing this, somehow I'm missing Wei's name in here. Oh, there's Wei here, but he should be up at the top. Uh, Ed Calloway's lab really was essential for this. Ed Note is a sort of a, a card-carrying uh, 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 neuroscientist who develops tools for mapping in the brain and studying particularly the visual system, and his lab did all these stereotactic injections. Margaret Bayron is my long-term collaborator who's a a neuroscientist who did all of these dissections, uh, an enormous amount of work, and she complains about her neck being sore from all the dissections all the time. And she's an amazing person. And Bing, who's, as you mentioned, we, we've collaborated on many, many projects. Um, I, I want to thank him 
very much for his long-term collaboration. And folks at the Allen Institute contributed data. And Aran Mukamil, who's a computational biologist, also contributed. He's from UCSD. I don't know what the I is there, but UCSD. And these are our funders, so I'll stop there. Thanks very much. All right.